You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. We have a lot of folks today who are called by themselves, or a man called them, but they haven't been called of God. God provided the necessary tools to Ezekiel, not man. And God provides us as we go into service for him, and we're doing what he's called us to do. He's the one that provides us the tools necessary to do whatever it is he's called us to do. God equipped Ezekiel. Man didn't. God did. Have you ever felt like God was asking you to do something in particular? Maybe it was going on a mission trip, giving money to a charity, or simply forgiving a friend. This is a calling from God. Today, Pastor Ken is going to be talking about how Ezekiel had a calling from God. When we are called, it is not by our plans or anyone else's. It is simply by the Holy Spirit that speaks into us. And when that happens, we can know that God will fully equip us with everything we could ever need to pursue that calling. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 3, as he begins his message, Ezekiel, Performance Prophet. We're going to find out that part of God's calling of Ezekiel was that he was going to become a performance prophet. He was going to be doing prophecies and teaching that are going to be based on things that he does. And we're going to find out also that he's going to do it being completely silent. It'd be like coming in on Sunday and say, okay, we're going to do the message, now watch. And you don't hear a thing for 45 minutes. Okay, that's it, see you next week. Well, that's what Ezekiel did. And we're going to find out that there was a lot going on when he started doing that teaching. So we're going to be starting off in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 22, and then Lord willing, we'll get through chapter 5. But uh, remember, Ezekiel has been confronted with the glory of God. With what we're going to see that Ezekiel's asked to do tonight, we will understand why God showed up the way he did. Because if God just said, Ezekiel, I want you to be a prophet, and then this is what I want you to do, I don't think he would have done it. So God brings the entire throne room in multidimensional glory to earth, and Ezekiel is kind of like, oh, okay. And he reacts as a result of that. I mean, anybody would, but that, it, his calling is so unique. It is, it is probably the most unique calling next to Isaiah that you see in the scriptures. But he's called, he's been commissioned, and God left him alone, as we talked about last week, for seven days, and he's stewed about what he's heard And now he's going to hear some more things, too. But he's had time to think it through. God's not taking no for an answer. And we picked up on that last week, too. God is not taking no. God is taking yes. There is no answer other than yes. And now God is following up with him. And now it's time to have him get ready for his first sermon. And when you think sermon, you're going, oh, well, he's going to be talking. And he's going to be saying, thus saith the Lord and all of these other things. No, he won't be doing that. We'll find out. Let's take a look at verse 22. The hand of the Lord was on me there. This is on that where he was being talked to there in Nippur, just south of Babylon in Iraq, was with me there. And he said to me, get up, go out to the plain, and there I'll speak to you. So I got up and went out to the plain. And behold, the glory of the Lord was standing there like the glory which I saw by the river Chebar. And I fell on my face. Well, Yeah, I I would too if I showed up and and there that is. Uh, The Spirit then entered me and made me stand on my feet. And he spoke with me and said to me, Go shut yourself up in your house. As for you, son of man, they will put ropes on you and bind you with them so that you cannot go out among them. Moreover, I'll make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth so that you will be mute and cannot be a man who rebukes them for their rebellious house. But when I speak to you, I'll open your mouth, and you will say to them, Thus says the Lord, He who hears, let him hear. He who refuses, let him refuse, for they are a rebellious house. Wonderful message, right? Ezekiel, I've called you to be a prophet. You're going to have a message that you're going to communicate to the masses for me. Now go lock yourself up in your house and be quiet. What? I thought you just called me on this, Lord. What's up with that? And wonderful stuff he tells him. You're going to get... Bound, 
<laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's the kind of stuff I want to hear. So Ezekiel went to the same place that he was at before when he confronted God in all his glory, and, and the glory of God came down when the throne room actually came from, the, from heaven and interjected itself into our little three-dimensional space called earth. He's being told, quite simply, no one's going to listen to you. I really want to be called to that ministry. No one's going to listen to you, Ezekiel. He's warned that, you know, they don't want to listen to you to the point that they may limit your ability to leave the house. They may tie you up in your own home because nobody wants to hear you. That's really encouraging too, isn't it? But, you know, why silent? Why not say anything? Because God has nothing to say to them. They're in rebellion. That's a sad state to be where God has literally reached the point that he has nothing to say to them anymore. We'll see as we study through Ezekiel that come around the fall of Jerusalem, all of a sudden Ezekiel can talk to everybody because now they're judged and God will be talking to his people again. But right now, the third attack on Jerusalem has not taken place yet. It's, it's still in the future. And what we have is a group of people, 10,000 or so, who were taken captive, moved forcibly over 1,000 miles uh, across the desert to uh, beautiful downtown uh, Babylon, just south of it. Uh, if anybody has ever been there, I have. It, it's not a beautiful downtown place. It's kind of a desert. Uh, not a wonderful place to be. Kind of hot in the summer. You know, if you like 120, it's a great place to be. This is where he's at. And this is where the people are. And they've gone from this nice green place called Israel to desert. And they're in rebellion because they don't think they're going to be there long. They think God's going to win and they're all going to go back. They don't understand that they're there because of their sin. Uh, the people may not be willing to listen to Ezekiel. And that's what Ezekiel's being told here in chapter 3. But the glory of God and the Spirit of God are still with Ezekiel. They're, they're not with the people, but they are with Ezekiel. Now you have to remember, again, at the same time that this is going on, Daniel and his friends are in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, and a guy named Jeremiah is sitting in a hole in the ground inside the, in the major area of Jerusalem where he's being held captive by the king. So you've got prophets wherever the nation is at this point. And as far as God was concerned, it didn't matter what the opinion of the people was. Ezekiel is only going to speak for the next seven years, literally, until we get to the, the chapter uh, where he starts talking again. He will only speak when God has something to say. I mean, it, it reminds me about one of the folks that used to be president of the United States, Calvin Coolidge. His nickname was Silent Cal. There was a story that one day he went to church and his wife was sick going to church and she asked him when he came home, says, well, what did the pastor talk on today? And Cal did not like to talk a lot. President Coolidge was very silent. He just said, he talked on sin. And his wife's trying to get him to say, well, what did he say about it? And he's again, it. that was it. This is the kind of stuff that Ezekiel's going to be saying, okay? He's not going to say a whole lot, but what he's going to say is maybe that kind of message. He talked on sin. He's not for it at all. He's only going to say something when God has something to say. By the way, they never really did bind Ezekiel. This might have been a contingent warning for him from God saying, look, if you don't follow what I'm going to say and you lock yourself up in your house, I'll make sure you're locked up in the house and I'll have them tie you up and leave you there. So that never happens, but, and he did obey. He did not do that. But the instruction given to the prophet was very different. He's not to enter into any conversations with anybody. He's supposed to shut himself up in his house and not talk to anyone until he's told to talk to somebody. I remember telling my kids that. Don't talk until you're talked to. But Ezekiel's 30, okay? Don't talk until I tell you. Great ministry. Now, the attitude of the people. Militant indifference, I guess, is what you could say. They really don't want to hear the message. They're in captivity, and they're in denial, and they are learning that that's not a river in Egypt. Uh, they are, anyway, bad joke. But they're in denial, okay? They're not recognizing the fact that they've been taken captive. They've been told this for years. They were warned by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy that if you do this, you're going to be taken captive. They did it. Now they're captive. 
and, and that's what happened. Um, they're just, they don't care. And Ezekiel has to do something to get their attention. That's what God's going to have Ezekiel do. He's going to get their attention. What do we, what do we see on television today now? If somebody wants your attention, they do something loud or outlandish to try and capture your attention, especially if you're doing stage acts or something like that. They'll, they'll do something loud or something really big to get your attention. I always get a kick out of stage shows where we start with a big production number. Well, why? It's to get your attention so that you'll watch. Look, I just spent $30 to come in here. You think I'm not going to watch? Yeah, I'm going to watch. But that's what is happening here. Now, this man, Ezekiel, is going to give God's word to all the people there. And it's the only time he's allowed to speak is when he's giving God's word to him. The rest of the time, he's not saying anything. He only has one thing to say to them, and that's the word of God. And the only time God speaks to them, he's warning them about their situation. So I, I love what this says. Yahweh's or God's denial of intercessory liberty, in other words, that's a fancy word of saying God didn't let him talk, it represents one of more means of dealing with the resistance to his calling. In other words, okay, I know you don't like what you're doing. Don't talk about it. Okay, he can't talk about it. He sat amongst his exiles for seven days, probably resisting the call. And if that's indeed the case, maybe that's why he has to be silent for seven years. One year for each day, he resisted the call of God. I don't know if that's what it is. Could be. As soon as I read that, I went, oh, I'm sure, whatever you want, Lord, not a problem. I am, you, you, wherever, whenever, you know, I, I want what you want in my life, because I don't want that. I don't want to find myself resisting for a day, and God says, I'll see you in a year. That might be it. But where the nation was spiritually at this time, the, there's only one thing that's going to help the nation, and that's God's word. There's nothing else that can help them. They're, they're pretty much toast at this point. So, here we are at the end of chapter 3. God has completed the overall calling and commissioning of Ezekiel. Notice who called Ezekiel. God did, not man. We have a lot of folks today who are called by themselves, or a man called them, but they haven't been called of God. God provided the necessary tools to Ezekiel, not man. And God provides us as we go into service for him and we're doing what he's called us to do. He's the one that provides us the tools necessary to do whatever it is he's called us to do. God equipped Ezekiel. Man didn't. God did. Because once you see what he's being asked to do, there is no way in his strength he'd want to do that. There's no way I'd want to do it. But if that's what God calls us to do, then okay. You know, I'd much rather be a plumber, Lord. Please call me to that. But that's not what God had for him. God's the one who does all the work. Ezekiel is simply the servant that God's going to use. Remember, he's been trained as a priest. He knows the Torah. He knows what the Word says. He came about his ministry and where he is in life as a result of being born during a revival. That's all part of his past. And now we're going to see what God has for him in the future. God has called him to be a prophet, but he is limited to only doing performance-based prophecy. So all he'll be able to do is act things out. And some of this stuff is going to last a long time, some of this acting that he's going to do. So it's going to be an interesting sermon that, he, that they're going to be hearing. Now, and we'll get, here's what he gets to do. It starts in chapter 4. You'll love this. Now you son of man, now again, that's the title that God uses for Ezekiel all the time. Get yourself a brick. Place it before you. And ascribe a city on it, Jerusalem. Then lay siege against it. Build a siege wall, raise up a ramp, pitch camps, and place battering rams against it all around. My mind is, already, here's a brick, and I'm building all this stuff around it in the floor of my house. Okay. Get yourself an iron plate. Set it up as an iron wall between you and the city, and set your face toward it so that it is under siege and besiege it. This is a sign to the house of Israel. As for you, lie down on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel on it. You shall bear their iniquity for the number of days that you lie on it. For I have assigned you a number of days corresponding to the years of their iniquity. 390 days. Oh, this is just getting better. 
Okay, so I'm going to build a model in the middle of my floor. I'm going to put a brick there. I'm going to inscribe some stuff on it. And then I get to lay on my side for the next little more than a year. Perfect. And God goes on. When you've completed these, you shall lie down a second time, but on your right side, and bear the iniquity of the house of Judah. I've assigned it to you for 40 days, a day for each year. Then you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem with your arm bared and prophesy against it. Now behold, I'll put ropes on you so that you cannot turn from one side to the other until you've completed the days of your siege. That's what God wants him to do. Great message, right? So I'm Ezekiel. So let me get this straight, Lord. You want me to lie on my side for the next 14 plus months. Most of it on my left and a little bit on my right. Oh, and I have read more commentaries trying to figure out why it's 390 and 40, and the 390 everybody can come up with, but the 40 nobody can come up with. Suffice it to say, that's what God said to do, and that's what, that's what it is. I've read the 40 is for the 40 years in the wilderness. The 40 is for the 40 years of Manasseh after he failed the first time. It doesn't say that. It just says 40 years. I'm not going to go into all these different reasons. Now, that's not all God said. That's just what I would have heard, Okay. But Ezekiel is not the first performance prophet. He is actually the third performance prophet. We've had two others before him. Isaiah was a performance prophet. He got to walk naked and barefoot for three years. It was a great ministry. As a sign and a wonder upon Egypt and Ethiopia. And Jeremiah got to wear a girdle without putting it in water, and then he got to hide it in the ground. Here, this is what it says in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 20, verses 3 and 4. The Lord said... Even as my servant Isaiah has gone naked and barefoot three years as a sign and a token against Egypt and Cush, so the king of Assyria will lead away the captives of Egypt and the exiles of Cush, young and old, naked and barefoot, with buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. That's what he did for three years as a sign to those other countries. Hope he had sunscreen. Jeremiah 13, 1 to 11, we have the, the story of Jeremiah getting to wear a piece of clothing until it is absolutely ripe. Thus says the Lord to me, go and buy a linen loincloth or girdle or a belt, depends upon what version you're reading, and put it around your waist and do not dip it in water. That's a nice way of saying don't clean it. So I bought a loincloth according to the word of the Lord and put it around my waist. And the word of the Lord came to me a second time saying, take the loincloth that you bought, which is around your waist, arise, go to the Euphrates, and hide it there in a cleft of the rock. So I went and hid it by the Euphrates. Now, it's it's translated Euphrates, or there's five different words it can be translated as. Somewhere it was buried. The Lord commanded me, and after many days the Lord said to me, arise, go to the Euphrates from there, and take from there the loincloth that I commanded you to hide there. Then I went to the Euphrates and dug and took the loincloth from the place where I'd hidden it. And behold, the loincloth was spoiled. It was good for nothing. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, even so I will spoil the pride of Judah and the great pride of Jerusalem, this evil people who refuse to hear my words, who stubbornly follow their own heart and have gone after other gods to serve them and worship them, shall be like this loincloth, good for nothing. For as the loincloth clings to the waist of a man, so I made the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah Cling to me, declares the Lord, that they might be for me a people, a name, a praise, and a glory, but they would not listen. Now, Ezekiel is being told to do his performance art, or performance prophecy, if you want to call it that, four years before the siege of Jerusalem even begins. So one of the things we studied when we were studying prophecy is that many times when a prophet first begins their ministry, they'll do a prophecy that's going to come true in the near term so that the things that they talk about they are going to be taking place way far in the future can be taken to the bank. Absolutely, they will happen. So that's what's happening here. He's being given the opportunity to provide a prophecy that's going to validate the fact that he's a prophet called of God. So four years before the siege begins, which is actually 586 B.C., is when he's going to start showing this. And the first thing God is having him do is, is provide a prophecy that's going to be validated rather quickly. Uh, pretty much. So four years in advance, he's going to show everybody in exile how it's all going to go down in Jerusalem in the future, in just a couple of years, when Nebuchadnezzar attacks and destroys the city. 
Now, we see here in chapter 4, he needs some props. He's told him to get a brick. Okay, the, the brick, in, in Babylon, they had this, these clay bricks these, that they would actually write on. In fact, the brick, they're, they're, when Saddam Hussein rebuilt portions of Babylon, he actually would have things inscribed on each brick indicating Nebuchadnezzar and Saddam Hussein. And so, they, I mean, they're still practicing what they were doing back in the er, earlier days. They're still writing on it. And then what he's telling Ezekiel is to get this fresh brick while it's still pliable, you can still draw on it, and draw the design of Jerusalem. So that anybody who looks at that brick sees, oh, that's Jerusalem. I can see the towers, I can see the temple, I can see all of that on that brick. So he has to be a little artwork, and he gets that brick, and it's not a brick, it's probably about like that, more than likely, and he lays it down. Now, whether or not he put the siege works in the clay, I kind of see it as more like a tabletop setup that you used to do before days of CAD CAM. If you're getting ready to do a combat operation, you would actually lay out where you're going to go. You would put it in sand, do a sandbox setup of it, and kind of, we're going to come here, the enemy's there, we're going to come around this way, and we're going to attack. So he's basically doing the same thing, but on his living room floor, which is nothing but dirt anyhow. So he's going to have the, the clay brick here, and then he's going to put siege works around it, which are normal items of warfare that are used at that time. They would put ramps, and they'd do all these other things to defeat the walls. And basically, the army would form up outside the walls and starve the people out who are inside. And they, they would be there for years at times. But they, basically, they're cutting off the supply of food, the supply of water, and just waiting for everybody to give up. It's easier than assaulting the walls constantly. But you would have these siege works, you'd have these towers, and all, all of these things there. Now, whether he made separate models or, or set them out individually, the Hebrew's not that real clear to us. But I, I personally, I think he probably wound up having to make these models all around it. So, I mean, not only is he building a brick, he's becoming experienced in, in, in clay modeling and doing uh, all these other operations to make sure that everybody understands what's going on. Uh, this way, if anybody comes in to see Ezekiel, first of all, they're going to knock at the door. He's not going to invite them in. He's quiet. He can't say anything. They'll come in and they'll see him laying on the floor on his left side or his right side, more than likely his left side. And he's staring at this brick. And one of his arms is uncovered. The other one's not. He's got a rope holding him up. Now, it doesn't say that he does that all day, but I mean, that might be what he does from nine to five. I don't know what his show times were. But it, the, the Hebrew kind of gives us the hint that that's what was going on. It was something that occurred every day at a set time. So we have this fresh brick with an outline of Jerusalem on the brick. And you've got these siege walls and these ramps and camps. I mean, you've got a camp here and a camp there. He's got it all indicated around there. So he's literally created this tabletop model of what's going to be reality in four years. But he's done it ahead of time. And then he's also told to get an iron plate Verse 3, get yourself an iron plate and set it up as an iron wall. Well, what's that all about? The iron plate, or the iron griddle, as it says in the King James Version, is that wall that currently exists between God and the nation. God can't look on them with approval and blessing anymore. There's a wall between God and the nation. So Ezekiel is being in the place of God, and here's that wall in front of him, this iron plate. God, God's not approving of what's going on in that city. He's not. He can't look with approval, and Ezekiel cannot pronounce the priestly blessing of Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 and 25 on them. Can't do it. God's face is not shining on them. God's face is stony, and he's looking at that plate. So glad you tuned into today's edition of The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken. For more information about this ministry and what we believe, you can find all you need to know at theunsafebible.com. Want to hear more messages from Ezekiel? We've got that too. Just look under the media tab. Again, our website is theunsafebible.com. As you've been listening to this teaching in Ezekiel, what are some of the things that come to mind? Do you struggle with unresolved sins in your life? Have you found yourself wondering why your life isn't going as planned? Can you imagine what it would be like to be exiled from paradise and to be told it was all your fault? 
That's the truth that Ezekiel had to deliver to the Jews from Babylon. It took 70 years, but they finally accepted their sin as their own and returned in faith to God. Where are you on that journey? No matter what the circumstances are, you must seek God in all things to ensure a singular focus on the one true God. We want you to find strength in your faith. And if you need help or have questions, you can contact us directly at theunsafebible.com. Just click on the Connect tab and the Connect card. Fill it out and we'll get in touch with you. If you're in the Jupiter, Florida area, we want to invite you to our next worship service. Directions can be found on the About tab by clicking the word Contact. We hope to see you soon. Well, that's all the time we have for today. But we want to invite you back again next for more encouraging and uplifting messages by Pastor Ken right here on The Unsafe Bible.